Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is writer Thomas Beller. He is director of creative writing and an associate professor of English at Tulane University. Beller is the author of five books, a collection of stories, seduction theory, the novel, The Sleepover Artist, which was a New York Times notable book and an LA Times best book of 2000, a collection of essays, How to Be a Man, Scenes from a Protracted Boyhood, a biography memoir, J.D. Salinger, The Escape Artist, which won the New York City Book Award for Biography Memoir, and most recently, Lost in the Game, a book about basketball, published in 2022. Bella writes for The New Yorker, The New York Times, Vogue, Town and Country, and The Three Penny Review. In 1990, he co-founded Open City Magazine and Books and served as co-editor there for 20 years. In 2000, he founded the New York City-centered literary website, Mr. Beller's Neighborhood. On February 22nd, 2023, Beller will give a reading as a guest of the University of Oregon's Creative Writing Program. Thank you, Thomas, for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be part of University of Oregon land. So um, tell us first a little bit about your background, where you're from, and how you came to be a writer. Wow. Uh, I'm from New York City. I was just sharing with Paul our shared childhood geography of the Upper West Side, and even more specifically, um, the avenues uh, west of Broadway, West End Avenue, Riverside Drive. Um, how I came to be a writer is a huge question. And since before we started recording, we had talked a little bit about childhood stuff and that geography, I'll say. Um, I had a neighbor in the building where I lived who had what was at the time a very impressive piece of technology called an IBM Selectric typewriter. And up to that point, um, my writing experiences had been very labored. I, my handwriting wasn't good. And it was just whatever was happening in my head was happening way too fast to get it on the page and everything. It just did. And then I had some kind of a creative writing assignment in eighth grade for a very memorable teacher, one of those teachers you remember, Mr. Colin, Larry Colin. And uh, it, for some reason, I asked to borrow, asked my friend if I could use his dad's electric, IBM Selectric typewriter, which I go into this in my Salinger book a bit, but like, it's now a bizarre, antique, strange, like mysterious. It's not like just a typewriter. It had like a little hand grenade metal ball that would like rapidly punch out the letters. And that was its big innovation that could go fast. And if you'd hit a key, it was like a, it, it, it was a percussive experience. If you could get a bunch going at the same time. And I pretty vividly recall writing what were my, I guess, first short stories on that typewriter for Larry Cohen's rather out there eighth grade English class at the Riverdale Country Day School. I, as an aside, want to say I've sometimes been toying with and talking about, so I better do it because I keep talking about it, writing a book called The Eighth Grade Canon, which is basically about the books I read for that guy, which would be like, <clears throat> for me, would have been The Catcher in the Rye, a separate piece, Lord of the Flies, To Kill a Mockingbird, The Great Gatsby, Colin Through and On the Road, which was a pretty outre selection for eighth grade. Um, and I'm maybe forgetting, uh, 1984, and and maybe Animal Farm also. But um, I think I'm tempted to, anyway, how did I become a writer? I sort of, I'll go there. I'll go to the IBM Selectric, me typing out short stories about a, messed up kid living alone with his mother in an apartment building. So thanks for that. And by the way, I have that same eighth grade reading list from my childhood in, in New York City. I went to the town school at that point. And so that was what we were reading. Anyway, so you write in a wide variety of forms and genres. I mean, I, I, I enumerated your five books. They're all, all in these different genres. Why, why has writing in so many different genres been appealing for you why is that what's been how your writing career has gone interesting question i think its roots of that maybe can be found in uh here i'm going to do show and tell i'm not going anywhere so 
So I'm going to show you a Polaroid, talk about antiquated technology of this guy, this, this here suit looking dude. And you see this other face like upside down and there's a tonic water on the stove, which is very suggestive of what we were drinking. And this is a college roommate of mine who was uh, the editor of the miscellany news at Vassar college. And in my senior year, I had the, honor the distinction it was like making varsity basketball i'd made it into something called senior composition which was the special class that you got to write a creative thesis as opposed to a scholarly thesis uh taught by a man named william gifford and i was writing short stories for my creative thesis and uh, i'm not being falsely modest when i say they were pretty bad and i just didn't have it and it was time to turn it in and then there was spring break of my senior year. And I had, well, I'll just simply say it was an adventure, my spring spring break of senior year. And I came back to campus, told my friend Owen, whose photograph you just saw, and he was the editor of the feature section. He said, why don't you write about that? Why don't you write it up? And so whereas all the fiction I'd been writing seemed very mannered and labored, this was a very declarative account of my of events of the previous weeks. Um, it, the piece ran, uh, it's called Spring Break at the Salvation Army was the title of the piece. And um, there's a sort of bifurcated quality to that, right? On one hand, I can't believe I just said right, by the way, because I feel like this is a, lexic a lexicological like fungi that spread through the culture where people keep saying right as, like, as though they need this affirmation. Anyway, the essay came so naturally the stories were very labored and not natural or particularly good. And I want to be a fiction writer. My first books were fiction. I really think fiction does something magical and not something that it's nonfiction is excluded from because nonfiction can become magical too. But nonfiction is nevertheless like it's the stuff of life. We touch it every day in one form or another. So there's part of me that's like, feels like the greatest spiritual place in letters is fiction. And yet I have a, dare I say, facility or inclination for nonfiction and for a kind of observational piece, um, for a piece that is noticing small details and making a big fuss out of them in the hopes of gleaning some wisdom or humor. Um, and so this juxtaposition of wanting to be one thing, but actually being another thing. Not that I'm not the first thing, but it's these two different modes that are you know related, but different, I think has taken me. And frankly, the first two books I wrote were fiction. I've been working on fiction, but my published work has largely been nonfiction. Um, the How to Be a Man and the Salinger biography, which was barely a biography. It was it's funny, Paul, that we were talking about these you can can I divulge your addresses to your audience? <laughs> sure, sure. Go ahead. Feel free. Paul had explained that he lived on 84th Street and West End Avenue, then 80, 90th, 90th, 90th and West End Avenue, opposite side of the avenue for that one, if I recall. Yes. And then later visited his dad at 76th Street and West End Avenue. And the Salingers had a more linear thing. The Salingers' parents were like, as I call them, the Jewish Jeffersons. They were like strivers. And they literally started on 155th Street, moved to a, and just moved downtown and 113th Street, Broadway, and then 82nd Street and Broadway, and then finally moved to the east side to Park Avenue, although kind of north of 86th Street, Park Avenue. So, but nevertheless, um, I just can't help mention that there's an echo between you and the Salingers, Saul and Miriam and your parents. Um, whether you and Jerry have an echo, I'll leave to you. But uh, so so that's probably how this eclectic output has come about, that I've got these two modes. They're both literary modes, but they're very different. And they come to me. One comes to me more easily than the other. So, Thomas, you have offered very generously to read a bit uh, to us from your book. Uh, newest work in progress. Will you just give us a tiny bit of background and then feel free to read away? Yeah. Um, this is another book of nonfiction. It's a collection of personal essays that are mostly about my family life as a father, 
Uh, I've been writing more and more directly about fatherhood or really more and more directly about the fact that my dad died when I was quite young, when I was nine years old and ramifications of that. And that is how my basketball book ends with a piece that connects to that fact. And this new book I'm going to read from, I'm struggling with the title. I think I want to call it On Finding a Spot, although the actual essay called On Finding a Spot is about looking for a parking place, which is maybe too trite. It's, it's been suggested, but the other idea was finding a place. It just seems a little mushy. And then the subtitle is one huge fiasco. And I'm everything about the title and the subtitle is unresolved and upsetting, whereas the manuscript is, I think, not bad. So in the spirit of trying to get my head right about that, I'm going to read the first, not the introduction, but the first piece, which I'm also thinking of titling the book after this, because the piece, the book begins with a piece called The Frozen River, and it ends with The Frozen River Reprise, or The Frozen River Part Two. So herewith, from a book whose title I can't come up with, but if you have any ideas, feel free to write Paul, he'll let me know, just kidding. Actually, I'm not kidding at all. The Frozen River Part One. Growing up next to the Hudson River, I wondered how strong the ice was when it formed along the shore in winter, whether it could bear a person's weight. I wondered about this from the window of our apartment, which, if I put my right cheek against the glass, from which, if I put my right cheek against the glass, I could see the river. A bright blue sky, choppy water the color of gunmetal, the buildings of New Jersey, a toy-like abstraction on the far shore, in the foreground on the near shore, below the park and past the West Side Highway, the snowy ice arranged itself in giant geometric shapes, extending 30 or 40 yards out into the river. The feeling of wind whipping just on the other side of the window, gusts of wind sometimes so strong they rattled the window frames. The outline of tree branches far below, tipped by frozen buds from which one day life would once more spring. And up above, in white briefs and a white undershirt, standing in an apartment so warm and bright that the coldness of a window pane felt refreshing against my cheek, I surveyed the ice. When he was diagnosed with blood cancer, my father was told he had two to 20 years to live. That was the spread, two to 20. He had lived for about eight of them by the time he got truly sick and had to begin an emergency round of chemo. Six months later, he was gone. In the years after my father died, his brother, my uncle Kuno, would sometimes visit us from Philadelphia and spend the night on the living room couch. My uncle had bristly hair that he wore on the longish side with a somewhat flamboyant side part and intelligent, attentive eyes. He dressed well and in his wake, there was always the fragrance of cologne. But the sense of finery around him transcended what he wore or how he looked or smelled. It was manifest most of all in the deliberate pace with which he spoke, moved, looked at the world, looked at me. Uncle Kuno's visits to our New York apartment had an element of multitasking, I now realize. He was visiting the wife and child of his late brother and so fulfilling a duty it was also true, though, that he was in New York for professional reasons and needed a place to spend the night. He could have afforded a hotel. I can almost hear the slight indignation in his voice, a sudden rise in pitch that was almost musical at the suggestion he couldn't. But these overnight visits combined his obligation to check in with his younger brother's wife and son with his sense of thrift. And there was his sister, Berta, who lived just a bit further uptown. He could have stayed with her, but she was a famously contentious woman he would have spent a large sum to avoid her couch. And here we were, so he didn't have to. My mother would put out a spread of cold cuts from Zabar's and brew a pot of coffee, actions reserved for the presence of special friends or dignitaries. This wasn't a question of formality or etiquette for my mother, or not entirely. She did this out of a genuine personal warmth and also an idea of how life should be lived. Nevertheless, I read these gestures of hospitality through the lens of a child sensitive to hierarchy, the sensibility of a prince who has lost his patrimony. Other than these languorous picnics on the kitchen table and the sight of him lying on the couch in the morning as I went to school, 
I saw little of my uncle on these visits, at least that I recall. His presence in the house during these visits was signified for me mainly by his toiletries bag, a beautiful leather object within which were housed any number of delightful mysteries. He always used my bathroom. The toiletries bag sat on the black porcelain shelf beneath the mirror. I was able to inspect it after school in his absence, plucking out the fancy German electric razor, matte black with its tight coil cord and three silver discs that did the cutting that gleamed in the soft afternoon light. There were many little bottles containing mysterious and fragrant liquids of different textures and colors, the glass clinking gently as I removed them and put them back one at a time. Now, remembering the pleasure of these inspections, I'm suddenly overwhelmed by sadness as I see myself at the age of 10, 11, 12, looking so curiously into my uncle's toiletries bag. From my earliest years, I had now and then play-acted with my father's things, slathering my face in shaving cream and pretending to shave while standing beside him in the bathroom mirror or wearing his shoes and tromping through the house with them. And this continued in those first years after his death, when his clothes were all still there. But although they were his, in a way, they no longer were. By this, I mean that with my father no longer there, the thrill of imitation had by necessity evolved into the thrill of usurpation, which was, in fact, no thrill at all. Now these items were just artifacts, and I wore them brazenly, carelessly. Maybe I understood that his clothes fitting me when I was 11 meant that I would outgrow them, that their utility was finite. But I was also reacting, I think, against what happens in many homes after such a death, when it becomes a kind of museum to the departed. There's one scene in Riverside Park that stands out. An afternoon game of pickup tackle football on the ratty lawn between the playground and the highway. I was wearing a pale blue Oxford shirt from Brooks Brothers that had belonged to my father. I wasn't athletic, but I was big enough and ran the ball with ferocity. They called me Little Larry Zonka. At least one kid did, once. Anyway, after a run up field and a tackle, I got up from the ground and noticed that one of the buttons had popped off the shirt. Upon seeing this, I burst into inconsolable tears. When I finally managed to explain that the shirt had belonged to my dead father, someone said, quite reasonably, then why are you playing football in it? And that's the end of that piece. Thank you, Thomas, for sharing that. It's a wonderful piece. Is there anything you'd like to say about it uh, before we move on? Yes. Um, it's just exhausting to not be finished with a book that you're close to being finished with because you just want to mess with it. I just, I feel all these things are wrong with that piece. I hadn't read it in a while. I think I should bring back the ice on the river again somehow, et cetera, et cetera. I just have to have faith that some of those themes, that's meant to be like an overture, um, like in the beginning of Carmen by Bizet, which I know and love because of the Bad News Bears. It begins with this big, overture fanfare type of thing that's my version of a fanfare and then we get into into the walter matthau land i kind of love walter matthau in every single movie he's ever appeared in and for many many reasons including that he's a genius i think but there's something about his hairline not the way his face is but his hairline reminds me of my dad you you bear something of a resemblance to walter matthau i'm you've probably been told that before never but i'll take it <laughs> So you mentioned uh, in that piece that you read uh, that you're not athletic um, or you weren't athletic. Um, your most recent book, uh, Lost in the Game, um, recounts your, among many other things, it recounts your experiences as a basketball player and collects uh, many of the essays that you have written about basketball over the years, as well as some that you had never published before. Um why why has basketball been a recurrent writerly interest for you? Ah, interestingly put. It wasn't a writerly interest. It was um one of any number of drugs and substances and activities into which I threw myself or through which I escaped myself. I think like a lot of tall people, a lot of tall kids, my basketball activities were a bit compulsory and not totally um wonderful you know we live in an age now where like basketball players are like superheroes superstars magical graceful 
they're dancing. Um, and yet we still have, when it comes down to it, you know, basketball practice, it's a torture chamber. Who the hell wants to do that? You know, thank God I escaped from football. They tried to put me on the, off, on the line. They tried to change me, make me into a center. And I was like, wait, so I just sit here and I get knocked over really hard over and over again. So someone else can run around behind me. I, I got out of that, but I did get sort of, and I suppose I had my own motive. I wasn't dragged into it, but it wasn't, um, I wasn't a great basketball player. I was a tall kid who kind of became drawn to the sport. And then I played in high school. I played in college, drifted away from it in my twenties. And then I came back to it with ferocity. And this is my theory, Paul, people who played a very, like, actually, this is great. We're at the university of Oregon. So if you're playing for the university of Oregon, I don't want to presume any of the current or past players and their relationship to the game. Everyone's an individual. But my general sense is, if you've been able to function at that level, you might be kind of done with basketball when you're in your 30s or 40s and 50s. Your body might have just taken enough of a beating that you're like, you know what? It's not worth the pain or the risk of injury. I've done, you know, I've, I've you've satiated that. I had a different experience. I was um, always an erratic player in high school and college, which included flashes. I'd have a big game now and then and so forth. Um, somehow when I came back to it in my late twenties, um, there was some unfinished business and I took it a bit more seriously and I wanted to be good in a way. I was almost more committed to the game at that point than I was when I was in college. So, um, um, that was an activity and the literary part of it was negligible. I did have, sorry, ramble on. Uh, I did have um, a weird moment shortly after college that a friend of mine who was a stringer for a wire service and covering the Knicks um, um, he, he, uh, I'm being harassed by my electronics and I need to um, um, make it stop. So just give me. Done. Sorry about that. Uh, I glimpsed professional basketball as a journalist is what I'm trying to say briefly. Um, but it was a, in a prehistoric era before the great renovations of the arenas that gave us luxury skyboxes and courtside seats for, you know, big shots. At the glimpse that I had was one in which um, it was from the olden world where basketball was less of a multinational corporation and the courtside seats were reserved for the teams, the officials, <clears throat> and journalists who were put along a thin table with rotary phones that they would use to call in um, statistics at the quarter, the quarter score, the halftime score, maybe a half, you know, and so that was proved to be meaningful later because I turned into this fanatical middle-aged basketball player, basically. And I played in gyms and in leagues, but I mostly played in playgrounds, which is its own curious subculture. Uh, and it was a curious subculture when Pete Axtham wrote the city game and when Rick T. Lander wrote Heaven is a Playground. These are totemic books of about playground basketball, city basketball uh, from the 60s and 70s. I don't want to pretend like I've discovered something. But generally speaking, a feature of the game that was less attended to compared to the tonnage of sports writing and beat reporting on all the different teams. And so what happened was um, the genesis of the book, Paul, was in 2014, I'm living in New Orleans. The NBA All-Star Game is coming to New Orleans. And in hindsight, in hindsight, I feel like the league was entering another um, Magic Larry moment, uh, another, Ma dare I say, MJ moment, an inflection point. We were entering, you know, LeBron James had broken through with the Miami Heat, but here comes Stephen Curry. And that crazy, crazy team with Clay Thompson and Draymond Green and so forth. And 
in hindsight, it it's like, I don't know, you guys are in Portland, Oregon. It would be like buying, you know, it, it felt like to start paying attention closely and start attending to the backstage machinations of the NBA in 2014 would have been like wandering into Beaverton and going, hey, Phil, what's this shoe company you got here in like 1974 or something? I, I'm exaggerating, but you know, a relevant, by the way, analogy, since the fate of all this is all very entwined. So um, I called the New Yorker. I said, give me a press pass. I want to go to the All-Star game. I was wowed by the All-Star game. Can I tell you the detail? I put this sure. in the book, but it floats by. This is about the point. There's two things. One is in the book, one's not. The thing that's in the book where I've just spent three days roaming around the dunk contest, the skills contest, the media room, the the way that it's all set up, the strange kabuki dance of the media room. Remember, I'd glimpsed prehistoric sports world. Prehistoric sports world was a much more ribald, naked, strange place of strange juxtapositions. Now we were in this glossy, slick, multimedia. Every player in that game was set up in a room like, you know, in a local news, you'll have like, let's go to the weather. And the weatherman's actually sitting at a desk right there. It's all this little sound stage. You're just cutting from one little desk. There's the weather guy. Here's their sports guy. There's the, well, th it was like that, except it was a much bigger sound stage. You just, everyone had their own little local news sort of anchor desk. There's Joakim Noah was an all-star that year. DeMar DeRozan was an all-star that year. That was 2014 was the first time that Kobe didn't play because of injury, but his press conference was the most mob thing. That was very revelatory. Um, I got through three days of this blitz. Um, and then the very, very last thing that happened, the last thing that happened, Kevin Durant gives a press conference. Not too many people are there. It's late. And they're asking questions about basketball and Kevin Durant. Um, he drums his hands he drums his hands on the desk and I go Kevin it looked like you were playing the piano you did that thing with your hands like you were playing the piano did you ever play the piano or maybe you're just in New Orleans and you know the music has got to you and he goes because you know Durant is so fascinating so wonderful as a basketball player and and so unique as a neurotic, a transparently neurotic athlete. It's, that's really rare. Not that they're neurotic, but that they're transparent. He goes, oh, man, I wish I played the piano. Oh, I should probably take piano lessons. And I'm like, I, I was stunned by that. Just random bit of emotion and longing and dissatisfaction, which now you look back and you're like, ah, well, Kevin is has a kind of like dissatisfied wandering soul quality to him. He's not okay with what he has. It's not okay to be one of the one, two, or three best players on the entire planet, one of the two, three, four, five most highly paid planners in the entire one of the most famous, one of the most adored. No, something is missing. If only he could have played piano. Anyway, anyway. At that point, I started writing about the NBA with the press credential and other pieces of personal writing I'd done that touched on basketball from a player's point of view, whether it was about my college experience at a small time Division three school or playing pickup basketball. At a certain point, I went like, huh, these two sit in an interesting juxtaposition to one another. And frankly, and I'm going a bit down the basketball rabbit hole here, but with all respect to Earl of Pearl Monroe and Tiny Archibald and Clyde Frazier and Pete Maravich, and uh, there's no shortage of dancing and shake in the early NBA. I don't want to buy into the J.J. Redick, they were playing with plumbers thing. But n nobody was moving in the NBA, the way that you see now, Jordan Poole, Stephen Curry, Kyrie Irving, where the list goes on and on, just these wildly dancing, you know, dancing, James Harden. Um, and that comes from street ball. There's a direct connection with that. And 
you know, the irony is in the olden days, street ball was played by NBA players. And now that's become more and more sequestered that if you're even within a hundred miles of playing, never mind the NBA, you might one day make the University of Oregon's basketball team. You're like in a bubble. You're you're not just roaming around climbing through a chain link fence to shoot. I mean, maybe you are doing that too, but you're probably on an AAU team, you're on a travel team, there's some money involved, someone's you've got a coach, you've got you've got LA assistant coach, Lakers assistant coach Phil Handy's Instagram channel showing you how to do dribble drills. Um, you know, but this is part of a larger thing in the culture where childhood has become specialized and professionalized. So once I had the NBA in its latest renaissance in front of me, and I realized that I had written a fair bit about pickup basketball, the book started to come into view. And that, that is one of the most striking things about the book is that combination of essays about pickup basketball and essays about professional basketball. So Thomas, we're coming toward the end of the interview. You are not only a writer and an editor, but you're also a teacher of creative writing. Tell us a bit about how you approach that project. How do you teach writing, creative writing? Um, I try to engage my students in work that I find interesting, and I try to talk to them about their work. Now, get ready, because I'm going to go way off the reservation here. In somewhat psychoanalytic terms, by which I don't mean it's therapy, I just mean like, You've written something. Let me tell you what I think works and doesn't work technically. Let me give you some ideas. Like, what if you did this? What if you did that? But the project is what's driving you? What's motivating you? What's like burning a hole in your pocket? What interests you? What's the problem you need to work out? Because so much of writing at any age is just figuring out what the hell to write about. Can I just interject a brief anecdote that I plan on doing when I give my talk, but I want to say it to whoever's witnessing this, it's going to take a minute. Go for it. Barry Lopez, the famous naturalist and essayist and fiction writer. I've got one of his books here from one of his first books of Wolves and Men. A guy who spends a lot of time, you know, in Alaska, writing about native cultures and tracking wolves and describing, you know, the most non-urban guy for the most part, a beautiful writer. I had invited him to read at Tulane right before the pandemic. He was unwell. And shortly after that, uh, he died. I'll leave it at that with a series of very different. The, the, there was a fire up there, which all of the people in Oregon was not going to need reminding about and his illness. And it just, it was a very, so not knowing that he was going to be dying imminently, but aware that I had a not totally healthy, distinguished older guy coming. Very excited to talk to him. The tradition is the guy shows up, your host, your your guest shows up, and you take them to dinner, because I fully expect to be taken to dinner when I show up in Eugene. So you take the guest to the university to dinner the night before he gives his reading, or she gives her reading. But I did not do this. I farmed him off to someone else. And the next day, I drove him around New Orleans, and I took him to this place below the quarter, way down where you have this bizarre angle on this hairpin turn in the Mississippi River. I thought, this is a good Barry Lopez site. And we stood there by the river talking. And I turned to him, full of feeling, and I said, I've got a terrible confession to make about why I didn't have dinner with you. And it's the antithesis of the oeuvre of your work. It's not about being alone in the tundra. It's not about observing nature. It's not about Native American cultures. Not that that's all he wrote about. Um, but there was a profound sense of solitude and nature are big themes with his Barry Lopez's work. Um, but I said, listen, it's the antithesis of you. It was a, it's just that the Lakers were playing the Pelicans and I had to see LeBron match up with Zion Williamson. I just had to see that. It was the first time. And I, I said that to him and he looks at me, he goes, you were at that game? And I went, you say that as though you care. He goes, I totally care. And it turns out this man who's renowned for like being up in Alaska for months at a time, spent his high school years on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, played point guard for St. Regis and is a basketball nut. And that was just a beautiful thing. And then I was like, I, when I got over my shock at that biographical fact, 
and he went on to share that, you know, he's always consulting box stores and so forth, keeping track. I then, you know, spoke at some length about the Zion LeBron matchup. And we had a very gratifying chat about that. And before we moved on to other things. So he died a couple of years ago. The pandemic, I think, has made it a bit difficult to sort of note that. I'm coming to his hometown and I wanted to give a shout out to Barry Lopez, uh, an all time great, who it just so happens has a passion for the game of basketball. And I wanted to make that noted in this context. Well, thank you, Thomas, for that anecdote. It's a wonderful way to conclude our interview. I'm really grateful for you to take the time to speak with us today. And we are so looking forward to your visit to Eugene uh, in a couple of weeks. Thanks again for uh, speaking with us. It's just been a pleasure. Pleasure for me too. I've been speaking with writer Thomas Beller, Director of Creative Writing and Associate Professor of English at Tulane University. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, please come to see Thomas Beller speak on February 22nd on the University of Oregon campus. Mm -hmm.